Thank you very much, Mike, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Mike, for your previous session. I thought that was very interesting. Um, in this session, I am going to talk about the readiness assessment that you have received earlier via email. And let me just share my screen quickly. You all see my presentation now? Yes. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to give an introduction to this exercise that we have uh, posted here uh, to you earlier. Um, so before starting your tracker project, it's really important to think through a few key, uh, key questions uh, that you have in this document, and we will talk through this in the session. Um, and you can fill it out as you go during the session, or you can just keep it with you for the for the next week or two, and or whenever you're starting your project, and and fill it in at that time. And we're also helpful, uh, as we said in the previous session, to to support you in the afternoons. There is a, a separate session for this project planning. Uh, if you want to discuss with us, so you can discuss on on Slack. So the learning objectives for this session is to just be aware of the factors to assess before getting started with your tracker project. It's not an exhaustive list, but I, we think that this uh, will give you something to start your, your thinking. And, um, and uh, also a little bit like high level uh, understanding of the consequences of not assessing preparedness properly uh, for your project. And we will also give a short intro to this intro to this week's exercise. And here is the famous word of the day that has been requested in the Slack channel a few times. I will leave this open for a few seconds. Digital development is the word of the day. So the, the word of the day can come in any session during the day. So I was the lucky one to be, uh, to be given the word today. Okay, I hope that most people have, uh, have registered the word by now, digital development. So uh, what we're talking about in this section, it really links back to what Mike was speaking about in the previous section uh, on the maturity model and this tracker house with some key foundational building blocks and some items to consider um, in your projects. Um, it links back to that. So you should have some background by now. Um, and sessions again later in the academy will give more insight into these topics. So. We want you all to think through what is the end goal of your tracker adoption? What are you trying to solve? Uh, what kind of IT support structure do you have in place to make sure that everyone is helped at a satis satisfactory uh, level um, in your tracker project? You need to think through issues such as connectivity and hardware, um, how the care or the service provision that you are mapping, to against, uh, mapping up against are, are being done today if there are existing information systems that your tracker program needs to interoper interoperate with, uh, and also if there are privacy policies or legislation that you need to take into account. And to help me discuss this, it was uh, nice to hear someone else's voice as well and some other projects. So I asked for some volunteers yesterday on uh, Slack and these uh, three uh, wonderful men, they uh, volunteered to help me out. So we have uh, uh, Shirzada Sadran from the Management Science for Health in Afghanistan. He is working on a tracker for keeping track of uh, health worker training. We have uh, Mohabir Tiluk from the Ministry of Health in Mauritius. He is working on a COVID-19 vaccine tracker. And we have Abdul Rahman Shahab from the HealthNet International TPO in Afghanistan. And he uh, wants to work on a tracker for extended program on immunization uh, in the clinics that they manage. So I think I will give the word to uh, Shirsara first to quickly present his project so you can get to know them a little bit and then we will have a conversation as we walk through the readiness assessment. Thank you, thank you Anna, and thank you Mike for the, for the um, uh, great session. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Shreep Sada Sadaran from uh, Kabul, working with the uh, MSH of Afghanistan as a data minor in visualization expert. Uh, so here's, uh, I just uh, thought so we have decided uh, that uh, the MSH has a project with the name of Afiyat, 
so we have beside other activity, one of the activities is uh, to the capacity building of the um, health managers, health workers in, in 34 provinces of Afghanistan, or I would say in all of Afghanistan. So, and the aim of this tracker program is to keep track of the participant and uh, in all over Afghanistan in a different capacity development program so they can have the record of all the participants, it who from where in which program he has participated. So based on this, it could be like uh, you know, giving us a, as a glance with uh, from which provinces, which health uh, post, which health uh, uh, or which NGO. Uh, who have participated in different uh, capacity development program or workshop or training. Uh, and uh, this tracker, uh, we are uh, planning uh, that this tracker should be used on the workshop or training facilitator. So, so they, are the, uh, they are the first who will be using uh, the tracker program. And uh, what we are planning that uh, uh, I will maybe it come after. Uh, that we have changed the, the paperwork to the, uh, to the tracker. So then the next uh, use will be the training participants. So we are planning to they, have, they can register uh, using the Android application uh, for, the, for the, the specific training and workshop. And the data at the end, the data will be used by uh, MSH uh, m &E team uh, in the central level uh, and also uh, the for analysis and also we are planning uh, to report regarding the training we have conducted in our Afghanistan, the list of participants and more detail to the donor. Uh, and uh, the last thing which I would like to mention uh, that uh, we are still, in, we are still uh, in, in the pause of assessment. So we are assisting, uh, we have assessment in our Afghanistan in different health posts uh, in the district level. Uh, so what will, uh, so we are assisting them to what is needed for the health worker uh, all over Afghanistan, what type of training they will be need. So based on those assessment, we will be um, preparing different kind of workshop, different kind of training. So then uh, still we don't know, we can't exactly see how much uh, the, the volume of that uh, um, program, the, the participant of the, each specific program in general, you can say in all over Afghanistan. Uh, so, so we, uh, so this is what we are planning for. So, this is what will be my next uh, assignment. It will be uh, doing my my first tracker program. Uh, so, that's all from my side. Anna. Thank you. And if there's any question, yeah, please. Thank you so much for your you. introduction to your projects. Um, you. The next one up is uh, to hear about the Mauritius COVID nineteen vaccine delivery project. Thank, thank you, Anna, and thank you, the DHIS2 team, for receiving me today here. And um, so today, uh, I would like to just give a brief about what we've been doing here with DHIS2 implementation. Basically, we started with the implementation of DHIS2 with, uh, with aggregate collection of data for integrated disease surveillance and response and for expanded program of immunization. But then with a COVID-19 uh, uh, with a COVID-19 situation, we we are doing the uh, we are planning to use the COVID nineteen surveillance package as well, but we have not implemented it yet. But for now, we have implemented the COVID nineteen vaccine delivery toolkit, and also the AFE reporting in Mauritius, and that started in March twenty twenty one. HISP Uganda and uh, University of Oslo have provided technical assistance for setting up the server as well as design customization of a platform. And um, WHO has assigned uh, myself as a national DHIS2 national implementer in Mauritius, but I'm also the epidemiologist at the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And um, so for now, we have collected tracker data for over 116,000 people. Uh, out of a population of Mauritius, which is one, one approximately 1.2 million people. However, we, we have been having some challenges with regards to, we have a backlog of 120,000 tracker data to be collected. And um, uh, uh, this is because we are having some issues with regards to uh, collection of data for profile, for the prof patient profile. This is taking us a bit of time. Um, next slide, please. Um, I can't see the next slide. Do you want me to maybe go? Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, 
so uh, what we have been planning to do be, uh, to try to address this issue with like regards to uh, the time taken to collect data for uh, patients who are coming for their immunization. So the Ministry of IT in collaboration with WHO and MOH have developed a preferred registration form, and um, which is the, pretty much the example that uh, Leos has presented yesterday. And uh, we are working on something like that. And uh, it has been linked to DHIS2 through API, API. And also we are, uh, Ministry of IT has an info highway platform, which provides sharing of data amongst government agencies. Basically we have a database of all, every single individual here in Mauritius with regards to their name, address, and any other data that has already been collected and has been, uh, have been collected on the platform. So this platform has been designed as a service platform which allows multiple government agencies to share data via e-services to other agencies. Also, we have the Data Protection Act here that has been implemented, uh, that has been established several years ago. And uh, so with regards to the Data Protection Act as well, like we, we, are, we are ensuring that the patient uh, tracker data are being collected in an ethical way and uh, also legally taking the legal aspect. This would allow um, the, the info highway platform will allow users to input national ID and support autofill of names, address, and contact details on the pre profile registration form. So what we're basically doing is like we type the ID and then all the other details with regards to name, address, and any other information that's available for the for the patient will be automatically filled on the profile registration form, which hopefully will help with reducing the time taken to collect data. MOH is currently assessing ways also to how to auto-generate vaccination certificates and travel pass, and to link with uh, COVID-19 tracker vaccine registry. That's the importance, uh, that's one thing I wanted to say about how important this COVID-19 tracker vaccine registry that has been developed by DHIS2, because with this, with this we can easily auto-generate vaccine, vaccination certificates or travel pass, which at one stage or the other will become an integrated part of uh, traveling in the world. And so I've noticed that Rwanda, Rwanda has already implemented such a program, and we are very interested in developing such capabilities here in Mauritius. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moabe. Then I will give the word to Abdul on the Afghanistan EPI tracker. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, as you have mentioned before, uh, we will be um, developing tracker for uh, the API services in health facilities, which uh, are currently operated by our organization, Health Net TPO in Afghanistan. Currently, we work uh, in three provinces. We manage around 150 clinics, uh, which uh, ranges from uh, the basic health center to district and provincial hospitals. Uh, my plan would be to start uh, the tracker in uh, one clinic uh, and uh, the purpose will be to strengthen uh, the follow-up and tracking of uh, children and women who are enrolled in the API program and uh, the clinic with, where we want to establish uh, the API tracker would be uh, Sarkani CHC in one of the eastern provinces, Kunar provinces and uh, it will only cover the EPI department. Uh, at the moment, we do not uh, want to link it to MCH services or others uh, <clears throat> based on some constraints. So maybe later we can expand it to other departments in the same health facility. And uh, mm, the, the system will replace uh, the existing uh, paper-based WHO and MOPH system for uh, uh, collection of information, which is based on registers and uh, some individual cards given to the mothers and children. And uh, uh, the idea comes from our health department and our organization to uh, pilot this and maybe later we can uh, advocate for expansion uh, to other provinces and uh, working with the ministry to, to adopt it in other clinics. Um, and uh, the support uh, uh, in place in our organization for the tracker and for the uh, aggregate uh, DHIS2, which we currently have, comes from the IT department and uh, from the program development uh, department and the monitoring evaluation HMS department. Uh, in Afghanistan, we have 3G and 4G mobile internet, um, DSL internet, and some other forms of internet provided by private uh, providers. 
but unfortunately, we do not have uh, uh, some data protection laws at the moment. I searched uh, today and I contacted some people, but I couldn't find, but there are some data protection laws uh, or uh, protocols by individual organization. For example, uh, the um, humanitarian assistance, the OCHA, they have uh, uh, their own data protection, which we are following in humanitarian uh, uh, projects. But for this tracker, we will need to develop a data protection uh, protocol inside in our organization. The resources which we'll need uh, at the moment will be the infrastructure, hardware and software and uh, the trainings. And also we would need to add some dedicated staff to the m &E, uh, because the one person we have is uh, responsible for the aggregate system. And I assume that we will need some dedicated person. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit about the health facility. Uh, in that particular health facility, we have around 2000 uh, women and children attending API services uh, on a monthly basis. And uh, the uh, patient flow in that health facility is uh, either the women go directly to, to the API department or they are channeled by other departments like MCH or uh, uh, the OPD. Uh, and uh, based on the current structure in the MOPH system, we have two vaccinators there and probably will think of adding uh, another person to look after uh, the tracker system. And as I said earlier, we are using the paper-based MOPH WHO registers. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, aggregate uh, DHIS2 in that health facility. It's part of our uh, 20 health facilities where we currently pilot the aggregate HMIS data. So maybe we link that to the tracker. And the clinic uh, only has access to uh, 3G and 4G mobile internet, which we will also use for the tracker. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this was very interesting. Three good examples of tracker projects, either in production or in the making. So I hope this can feed us a bit of a good discussion background for, for, the, for the readiness assessment. So uh, the first uh, sort of a batch of questions in your Excel sheet is this uh, objective. What is the objective of your tracker? These are sort of the very first issues to, to think through um, when you consider if tracker is even the best way to solve your problem. So the, the first question here is, what is the objective? What is the problem that you are trying to solve? Um, for example, if your objective is to better distribute uh, books among students, for example, in a school, then and you want to ensure that there is one book per pupil in the classroom, it might be tempting to have a tracker to ensure that every child has received a book, but perhaps you could do with, with just counting the number of uh, students and the number of books and link it to a classroom where you don't necessarily need tracker. So really sort of think through what the objective of your tracker is. And also who is asking for the system? Is there demand for the data? Is somebody asking specifically for this data? Can you sort of envision what kind of meetings, what kind of discussions around the data uh, where, where the tracker data will be used in practice. And this can be ranging from uh, a health uh, worker using the tracker data for, for decision support, for example, up to the national level where you would like to understand um, the, the reasons for dropouts or who, who is missing services, for example. Um, you would also have to consider the reach and scale of your project. So how many users, how many sites, the geographical spreads, and how many tracked entities approximately. Of course, you will not have all these answers 100% uh, correct in the beginning, but it should be something that you think through to understand the load of the system, um, how you should train, et cetera, et cetera. And also you need to think through and assess before you start what is it replacing? How do they do the service today? How do you track books or students or pupils? Or how do you ensure that people get vaccinated? What are the current sort of um, way of gathering this data today? And what are the gaps? Because that's probably where you would like your tracker system to, to fill in because there is a gap in the information flow. So um, I then have a question to my three uh, helpers. Uh, who is asking for this new system? Do you have uh, explicit sort of need saying that we would really like to make this type of decision, but we are lacking the proper data to do so? 
Yeah, yeah no, in, 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 case, in case of my record, so, you know, so I will uh, say, so the first, the need for the system is uh, the requirement uh, that uh, uh, the system you wanted is the organization I'm working for. Uh, so, uh, and the main objective of this uh, system that we want to change the paper base uh, uh, record keeping uh, from uh, paper base to uh, a digital system. Uh, so this is the main objective. Of this. So, so the one the major problem is that we are going to solve using this system, as we are working in, in 34 provinces in in their day in their days. So we uh, before we will do, we were doing the uh, all these uh, um, card in a paper base. We were collecting them from provinces. We were bringing it uh, here to the to the main office, and then we had a local system which was uh, which is developing Microsoft Access, and then we had a data entry guy who was putting all those data from paper to the um, access database and local. Uh, so the main objective is just to you know, to change. Uh, to just reduce, uh, I would say, I would not uh, say, but our plan is to 100% replace the paper-based system to the digital or DHI tracker. And uh, I think uh, the initial stage, uh, we have uh, 34 provinces, so there will be 34 sites. Uh, and uh, we are planning this uh, uh, by using uh, uh, the Android app. So we will be having, uh, in every session, we will have uh, a number of, uh, um, no, um, uh, tablet. Uh, so during each training, during during each workshop, all the participants will be filling uh, uh, their, their information, uh, or uh, the facilitator will be entering the information uh, regarding the training, regarding the workshop. Uh, so in the, uh, in the in the last, I would say, so we uh, we are uh, replacing the uh, the manual system, I would say, to the digital system. Thank you. This from my side. Thank you, Abdul, you had your hand up. Thank you, Anna. Um, for um, our plan tracker system in Afghanistan, uh, in, in the One Health facility, uh, it mainly comes from the health department because they, they would like to uh, track the defaulters and uh, the women who missed, uh, children and women who missed their uh, um, scheduled uh, shots. And also, uh, it has been a desire at the health system level from uh, the last uh, couple of years um, that uh, uh, we have to move to some uh, um, electronic based systems for the various function inside health facilities. So this was something we have uh, uh, suggested in our proposal for the health services in that particular province. And uh, the first step was to establish the aggregate system and now we are trying to do the, the remaining part. So this is part of the process we have uh, committed to and also there is a huge need. That's great. Um, and then maybe I could ask uh, Morbir in Mauritius. Uh, did you start out with like a paper-based system for COVID vaccination or were you ready with Tracker as soon as you had your first vaccine? Maybe you didn't really replace anything for this. So, so basically, um, you, you see, like when we, we we had the national action plan um, for COVID nineteen vaccine uh, vaccination, basically what uh, happened is like one of the uh, thing we mentioned in the national action plan is that we're going to going to collect it in the beginning both paper based and um, through DHIS two. When uh, DHIS two was set up for the COVID uh, immunization program, um, it was basically set up on time. Thank God, but <laughs> it was just on time for collection of data. But the thing is, like at this, uh, we had some issue with regard uh, the data collection was happening on yet central level because of uh, a bit of uh, we didn't have enough tablets and um, computers and all that to for all those vaccination centers because we have like approximately like uh, when we started like probably fifteen or sixteen vaccination centers, so we had a bit of an issue with that because we had. Uh, to import things and all that with the restricted um, um, border closure and all that. We, we had some issues to get those equipments, but we are planning to get them and we will get them very soon. And um, that's so for now, basically it's both paper-based and through DHIS2. Um, so uh, of course, like we are aiming to expand data collection to those vaccination centers instead of carrying those papers 
back to a central level uh, and then collect the information there and then send those papers back to the vaccination centers again. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Thank you. I think I'll move over to the next uh, topic. Just clicking in the right place. So uh, another topic that you need to assess before you get started with your tracker program is uh, your IT support structure. We've mentioned this a bit earlier in the course as well, that the there is a big difference of supporting maybe uh, 10, 15 district uh, data officers in, in a few selected sites in the country, down to a very huge increase of health workers, for example, if you aim to do data entry at every clinic providing uh, MCH services, for example. So you got to think through, how do I provide support today for those uh, giving, uh, uh, collecting aggregate numbers? Because that's the, the scenario you usually see is that you already collect these aggregate numbers, but now you also want to collect for the individuals. How do you do this today? Who are the people involved? Do they have more capacity to support more people, for example? And then how do you plan to support the, the tracker projects in the future? So you have to look at, of course, the number of, uh, the number of users you will have, where they're placed in the country. Can you manage to support everyone from a central location in the capital or do you need a distributed system like uh, we talked about earlier? So very practically, it's like who will pick up the phone when someone calls? Who will fix a device that doesn't work? Who will deliver a new device that is broken? Because uh, at least if you do this point of care data entry where the healthcare worker is sitting with the patient and entering the data on the fly, then you need that device today and not in three weeks time when you have procured it or fetched it from a central storage unit. So um, I'm thinking which of you this project has the biggest reach? Perhaps it's the COVID vaccination uh, project. So I will ask you for this. How, how are you planning support and what's your experiences up to now on supporting these tracker users? Thank you, Anna. Uh, so basically, like uh, what we're planning to do, we are in the process of receiving, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we had some issues with re regards to infrastructures, with providing enough uh, computers, laptops, and uh, tablets. But we are, in a certain, thanks to the collaboration with the Indian Ocean Commission, we are we're going to receive like probably approximately 50 tablets, uh, which is, we'll use the Android data DHIS2 data collection uh, mm -hmm. app that's available and uh, in, with regards to internet um, it's not an issue in Mauritius we we have a pretty much good internet uh, facilities here and uh, we or we even can set up wi-fi mobile spots uh, hotspots that mm -hmm. um, can be moved from one place to the others and so with regards to that infrastructure it's not an issue mm -hmm. yeah, with regards to server as well it wasn't an issue we uh, we had support from HISP Uganda and who has uh, helped us to find the right requirements, server requirements. And uh, we have set up that and this is looking good as well. We've not been really having much issue. And um, uh, so what we're planning to do is like probably once we receive all the tablets and uh, all those hardware required, we will, uh, we will be able to collect data. Instead of collecting data centrally, we will collect it in each individual vaccination site. So that will help us out with regards to catch up with that backlog that of 120,000 data that we have yet to, call, uh, to enter. But if, you're, if your vaccinator is having trouble, he drops uh, the, the tablet on the ground and it breaks, who does he call? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who, helps, of course. who helps this poor man in the middle of nowhere that's doing it? Yeah, that, that's, that's the thing like, oh, we, uh, we have, we have the people here who would assist with providing maybe laptops or anything as a replacement. But again, it, it is a major issue that we have to look into. And I yeah. agree with you. I agree. We really maybe even have to set up a proper plan, planning mm -hmm. for, for that in case of something like that happen. And also, like, if I may take an example, like with regards to the entry, you might recently we had a COVID outbreak in a vaccination center and mm -hmm. uh, we had to isolate everyone. So data entry operators have to be isolated and everything. So oh, right. no data entry is being done. So there is a lot of things that of course, a lot of challenges that's coming up, but I think uh, with proper planning and with a proper plan and SOP, we can really um, yeah. 
uh, how can I say, deal with this situation. Um, yeah. Also, another thing is like we need in terms of when you talk about IT support structure, we talk about security as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a server administrator to ensure the maintenance in the server, like the database is being maintained properly, and also a database manager as well. That's very, a very good point to think about all these things. It's like you want to, you want to make sure that everyone is up and running at all times and doing things that are not against the law or uh, that you are losing data, for example. So being prepared to support exactly. you. Exactly. And, and anyone? And the Ministry of Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Please, Korea. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, and with regards, when you're talking about the legal aspect as well, and um, uh, we have, uh, I've mentioned about the Data Protection, protection Authority, and uh, the Ministry of Health has a Data uh, Collector Certificate. So all data that are being collected or being ensured, um, the survey is located also at the government uh, center, IT server center. Go, it's called the Government Online Center. And basically all the servers are, are there. Um, they are cloud-based, but they are there. And so they are being maintained by the government agencies. So this has well help um, maybe ensure that people are aware that the data are being collected not by any other external agencies or mm -hmm. external servers. It's all here. That's great. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, anything thank you, Anne. Uh, from uh, Team Afghanistan on this topic, have you made any thoughts around how you plan to support your project? Uh, Anna, if I start first, so um, for for the time being, uh, for this uh, limited uh, uh, number of uh, devices and only one health facility, we will not face much problem because the existing IT support we have in organization and uh, the administration support we have at the province, uh, we can uh, respond to those kind of issues promptly in terms of uh, provi providing uh, uh, hands-on support to uh, the data entry officers, uh, the vaccinators at the health facility. Uh, that can be done by the project supervisors who are located uh, near to the health facilities. Uh, and they will be trained as part of a cascading uh, training program, as earlier mentioned by Mike. So we can have a few trainers at the national level and then uh, um, some, so some more trainers at uh, the province level who can, uh, who can be assigned to, to a specific number of health facilities to provide uh, support. And in terms of uh, the server administration and uh, other things uh, related to the entire system that uh, will be done by the IT department here in the m &E department, but we will need some dedicated staff at the moment. Uh, we do not need much uh, financial or other kind of support for this one health facility, but we, when we are expanding to the other uh, health facilities, definitely we'll need uh, some uh, hardware and IT, additional IT support. And mm. uh, that, that will be part of the planning. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Shirzada, you want to share anything on this topic? Well, I think uh, uh, I think this is uh, very important that uh, the question which you asked it who will and who will take your phone and who will fix your device. So mm -hmm. this was the question I think uh, uh, asked by whole organization uh, and, and by the level of tracker program I proposed uh, because it is a very uh, small scale pro uh, tracker program uh, and the IT support the infrastructure which will cost a lot. Uh, so this is a I think very important in every tracker program to consider um, what you are doing to uh, what you are planning for a tracker program and who will support. And in my case, this is just a start, and uh, this will be because we had another a large scale tracker program and complex in, in, in coming days. Uh, in, in question to this, uh, um, because uh, we have a huge support from our headquarter, MSH headquarter, so we have a uh, a great IT uh, support in, in terms of server, in terms of other facility. Uh, and the rest of the thing uh, which we'll be doing, like uh, the support we will be providing to provinces, not only in this tracker program, in the trackers we are planning the coming days, uh, which is a huge and complex level of, uh, of analysis or uh, assessment and uh, tracker program. So, so for so we have uh, we have already uh, discussed this before uh, planning the tracker program with the uh, with the central or uh, the headquarter in the state and uh, also the in 
in sich Afghanistan. So now the, the headquarters where I, I believe we will uh, provide support and we will have uh, a details to instance uh, specific for MSH Afghanistan. Uh, and the main idea is that uh, we will be helped with local and then uh, and later it will be sent with the um, MSH headquarters because they are also and the DHS2 uh, for, uh, for international um, data. So, so, so this was my side, I think, uh, um, because we have uh, we have all these infrastructure, we have uh, tools, we have uh, tablet, we have resources, and also we have a great team here in, in Afghanistan you know, as an MLA team, so we have that. Thank you. Great, that's amazing, thank you. So yeah, who will pick up the phone? Keep that in the back of your mind when you're working on your uh, readiness assessments. And we do see from, and I've read also plenty of research papers, really showing to this um, the value of doing supportive supervision, having people that can actually go out to the sites of the people who are using the system, sit down with them, help them in their daily day-to-day -day work. It's not necessarily only sort of classroom training, but having people check in now and then, now and again, to see how things are going and if there are problems that have shown up. So that's also something to keep in mind. The next topic that you need to consider when you are uh, planning for your tracker project um, is connectivity and hardware. So while before, maybe if you collected aggregate data at 15 district uh, offices with relatively stable internet, electricity, and so on, uh, when you're planning your tracker project, assuming that this now will go down to the lower levels of whatever service you're providing, you need to think through and understand what is the connectivity and hardware situation in these sites. For example, um, is electricity stable everywhere? Can they charge their device? Or is it, uh, will that be a problem? Uh, is electricity only available for certain hours of the day? If so, maybe it's a bad idea to plan for, uh, to plan for uh, a data entry at point of care, I mean, then it would be disastrous if your devices run out of electricity. You need to think through internet connectivity and also the varying degrees of connectivity, as was mentioned in the previous session. Uh, do you have to think about using Android, for example, for parts of the country or for all of the country for doing your tracker projects? Or can you manage with a web uh, version uh, if you have a stable connectivity wherever you are, or it's not super critical that the data is entered exactly on time. So that's also something you have to look, look at. Do you want to do direct data entry where the patient, when you're sitting with a patient and you have an unstable uh, internet connection, then you maybe you should have some uh, flashlights uh, uh, blinking and thinking through uh, how Android could help you out. And you also need to think through this, uh, the current devices that you already have. Um, do you need to procure a lot of new devices? I will talk more in terms of budgeting in a later session, but what is really drag and cost up when doing tracker is devices and it's end user training. So do you have to buy a thousand new devices or can you reuse devices from other projects? I've worked in countries where, um, uh, where one health program, for example, have invested in, in tablets to, to track uh, one type of disease, if it's immunization or if it's HIV data, for example, is it possible to link up with, with the people who already have a device and add your tracker program to that device? Or that the, the end user can access the tracker program through that existing device. So you have to map out the device situation. And in case you are using Android, you need to make sure you know which version of Android that device is running, because it has implications for, for how you set up Android. That will also be covered in a later session. So maybe from, you said uh, that in Mauritius, the internet connectivity was uh, was pretty good and stable. So maybe it would be interesting from Afghanistan to to hear what, what is the connectivity situation in your site and how are you planning to mitigate those problems? Well, uh, I think uh, we had uh, measured the first two points, which you have mentioned. This is a I think this is the biggest challenge for us, which is the first one's electricity. Uh, in, in the DHS2 instance, which we are planning to implement it locally in Afghanistan in our office. So the first challenge we had is stable electricity. 
uh, that uh, because we can provide a backup, but it will be also uh, not for because sometimes the electricity gone for 24 hours or 36 or 48. So this was the the first challenge, and the second challenge is uh, a stable internet connectivity. As Mike mentioned in, in his session, that uh, if the aggregate level of data system has been down, the aggregate level of uh, data is won't be a problem for the field level of health worker. But for the tracker, it is a problem if the if the system down for a day, for two plus two days, or more than two days, um, because there will be um, there will be a problem in, in, in tracking in tracker data. So we had we faced these two uh, uh, in the first two electricity stable electricity and and a stable uh, internet connectivity we have in in, uh, uh, in a capital also, but it is more in internet connectivity is a huge problem in provinces in in a rural area. So so yes yes yeah. So the case is changed in Afghanistan compared to other countries. I think. And maybe also a question maybe Abdul would like to answer this, but <clears throat> do you have a plan for what to do in case you are out of connectivity or electricity for a while? Do you have like a con sort of a contingency? Maybe you're not that far yet in your project, but do you have like a contingency plan for, for okay, we are out of, we cannot use our devices for a week? Uh, how, how will you make that work? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Anna. Um, uh, in addition to the points raised by uh, Sherzada, uh, mostly their work, they, they are dealing with uh, maybe with the provincial headquarters where they have offices, uh, but our system, uh, the, the plant system would be in health facilities and the situation is somehow different. Um, uh, you, we, we have a uh, um, few options for electricity supply and health facilities. We have generators, Mm -hmm. um, especially in health facilities where we have laboratories and where we have operation theaters. Uh, and also we have solar panels in most of the health facilities. So uh, in terms of uh, having uh, um, a source for charging the devices, I think we will not uh, face problem now or even if we expand, unless we, we add uh, uh, desktop computers which need um, instant electricity that would be a problem but still we can solve that through laptops which can store um, charge uh, but and, and in regards to having a backup plan for for entering data in case of uh, uh, electricity outage uh, I think we can do that through um, sending the paper based uh, um, um, re uh, paper based records to the provincial, uh, HMIS person uh, for a couple of days who can uh, who can enter the data uh, and once the electricity is resumed or the problem is solved in the health facility they can uh, go ahead with the uh, usual uh, um, instant uh, data entry so I think that that we can do other than that uh, uh, I think uh, we do not have any other option thank you so much and Mauritius, are you all okay? And there, the power is super stable, and connectivity is not an issue with you. Well, uh, but, sorry, just one moment. Uh, so basically, like uh, as you know, we're a pretty small island, mm -hmm. and um, with regards to connectivity and all that, it's not really an issue for us. It's not the same as in the context of our bigger countries. And um, so, with regards to electricity, we are uh, and uh, internet, it's pretty much stable. There has not been really any issue. Maybe sometimes drop out, uh, like once in a while, like you know. But like we don't lose connectivity. Mm. Uh, the speed might be reduced. Okay, like in some situation where they might be working on cables and the seawater cable and all that. But like we don't really have much issue with regards to electricity and internet connectivity. Of course, with regards when we talk about devices, I think I've already mentioned that early on. Like yeah. we are getting new tablets and all that, but like, yeah, once we get that and we will hopefully have some progress with regards to collection of the data regionally or in the vaccination centers. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and as I also stated on the slide, I mean, this impacts how you budget, the cost, how many devices do you have to buy? Um, how do you have to provide connectivity for your end users? Do you buy have to um, factor in to buy airtime? How are you going to do that practically? 
Um, how will you provide training on Android versus web? How will you support them in the field? Yeah. So it, it, it impacts many, many different things. Then you need to think about what sort of is the current system for service provision. I have the example of health care, but it can, of course, be uh, tracking um, health worker training, or it can be tracking students in school, or it can be to track malaria hotspots or many different use cases. But let's just use health as an example here. So you need to think through how does the facility give care today? What is the patient flow? What happens from the patient physically in the clinic, walks through the doors, who do they speak to? Do they go to this desk first and then that desk, that desk next? Uh, do they speak to a nurse first and then to a doctor? And what kind of paper is filled? Um, what are the admissions for getting entered, et cetera? And trying to sort of scope out your tracker program. Is it something that covers the whole flow from walking in the door to leaving, or is it just when you're sitting together with the healthcare provider and specifically discussing your disease and trying to sort of map out the whole workflow and, and, and figuring out where does your tracker fit in in this whole, uh, in this whole chain. It's also important to assess the, the, the business and the patient load in the clinic. Is this a very high volume place where you have uh, lots and lots of people queuing and you're helping people like Or is it a place where things are moving slower, you have more time that can, for example, give an indication whether you should do this um, point of care data entry or if you need to have a, a dedicated data clerk to do the data entry back office. You could typically think that if you have a very high volume clinic. Uh, it can be more challenging to do the point of care data entry because if the system breaks, you don't really have much room to fix it. If you need the, you need the information to be available in those five minutes that you actually see that patient, maybe it's easier to do to have a paper card and then you enter the data later. Um, there's no right or wrong answers there, but you have to make a decision based on uh, on proper investigations of this of the um, of the current situation. And the same, you should also assess the health worker burden and the staffing situation. So it's sort of related as well to the, to the business, but how, how much work does the, the health worker have to do? Does data entry come on top of a lot of other tasks? Will this just lead to put another stone to the burden in a way? Or are you able to build a tracker system that also gives value to the healthcare worker? that will help that person in their day-to-day -day work and rather taking the workload down instead of up. If they can uh, skip running one extra mile to the records office to fetch a file and then running back, then you've saved them some time. So try to sort of, to assess these things. And, and also how information is currently captured today. What are the different artifacts that the, the health workers are using to capture data? Maybe the patient has a patient file or a patient card, and then there's some paper in the health provider's office. There are some administrative documents. Trying to understand the full picture of the information that is gathered about this patient and how can you make this more efficient using Tracker. Maybe you can eliminate some of the paper tools, or maybe there are paper tools that are important to keep because they have some sort of value uh, to maybe to the, to the patient or to the provider in, in some sort. And, and I highly recommend to go out and doing some field work. I mean, go to a clinic, sit there and observe, spend a week in a busy clinic, spend a couple of days in a quiet clinic and try to really understand sort of where are the pain points for the health worker and where can we help them with a the tracker program? Because making a tracker program and training a lot of people and buying devices, it's a huge investment. So make sure that you properly think through uh, what are the needs and how can this program help the people on the ground? And once you have more sort of answers to this uh, ready, it will impact um, how you design the workflow, if you choose to do secondary or point of care data entry, um, how you link to paper tools, uh, how you choose to train, who should be trained, who should support, uh, privacy considerations perhaps, are there certain information that one part of the clinic should know about but not the other part, is some information sensitive so it should be visible to some not others. 
there are lots of different things that this will make it clear. And from own, my own experience working with contact tracing in Norway, this was probably the area that uh, not surprised us the most, most, but that really sort of added to the complexity of the project is how does a contact tracer work? How do they identify who the COVID positive person have been in contact with? What kind of questions do they ask? Um, uh, when do they pick up the phone versus starting the system? Maybe some people want to, to check some information first, then they phone, then they go back to the system and work. So really do some field work and some, uh, be, be a researcher here and try to document as good as you can with text and pictures and whatever works for you. Uh, anyone from the, from the team here that has any thoughts around these uh, topics? Uh, yeah, the yes, Anna. Yeah, I think uh, you pointed out two very critical considerations. Uh, uh, um, you know, in uh, our example, as I uh, mentioned earlier, this will only be implemented at the EPI section uh, at, at the moment, although we have to uh, expand it to the entire uh, infra entire services uh, uh, structure of the health facility in future, the MCH services, uh, the OPD, uh, the midwife and uh, other, other kind of services. But at the moment, it will be only inside the API section. So uh, women and children, uh, they uh, either go to the API section directly because they were asked to go there um, or they come to the OPD first or to the MCH, the midwife, and then they are referred to the API section once the doctor or the midwife see their car cards. So that's the way how the patient uh, flow works. Uh, and in terms of uh, the patient load, yes, uh, in some health facilities, we have a lot of patient loads and uh, the uh, two vaccinators, one of which mostly go to the field for outreach work and only one stays inside the health facility. Uh, they might not be able to also handle the data entry, the instant data entry. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to sort out. But in this particular health facility, I think we will not face much problem because of uh, the moderate number of uh, patients. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, currently the system is entirely paper-based. Uh, only the health facility in charge is doing uh, aggregate data entry at the end of the day uh, from the various uh, registers and data he receives from the various sections. So the one, the one clinic where you're trying this out first, is this, you're considering this like as a pilot project and you will see how it goes and then you will expand. Do I understand correctly? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This will be a, a pilot exercise. Yeah. So it's very interesting though to see how this, uh, uh, how other sites differ from this site. So maybe something that works well in one context uh, is not feasible in another context and so on. Yes, yeah. yes, we, we have to keep eye on all these factors once we expand, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Shri Sada, do you have any comments on this? No, no, I don't have any, sorry. No? Okay. Moabir, any uh, any comments? How how busy is the vaccination clinic in Mauritius? Are they are there long um, lines of people it's... waiting or you, you you basically read my mind and uh, <laughs> yeah, so basically that and uh, the, the, uh, basically it's a very good question uh, and uh, um, you see we are planning to reopen borders in uh, July here uh, 2021 and being Mauritius being a touristic tourist destination so we are planning to achieve herd immunity by uh, 60 percent uh, mm -hmm. herd, herd immunity but um, we are uh, to achieve that. If for, if we uh, at the rate that we are going, we need to, to get thirteen thousand vaccination done daily. Wow. So uh, yeah, it's it is a pre pretty much significant number, mm. and, um, and and to because we are planning, we need to open borders soon. There is no other way out. We have to open borders soon, uh, and um, so what we have to do is like we do thirteen thousand vaccination daily. Now, when, when we put that in the context of data collection for DHIS two, at the moment we program, we have approximately hundred data entry operators. Okay, 
And those 100 data entry operators at the moment they're doing, each data entry operators are doing like probably approximately because of uh, how extensive the form is, the data collection form is, they're taking approximately maximum, minimum five minutes to collect, to put data entry on the DHIS2. Mm -hmm. And the, the issue with that is like, at uh, that, that rate we are going, uh, we are not doing, we, I don't, we don't know how we're going to do 13,000 mm. collection, uh, data collection daily with the amount of data entry operators that we have here. So uh, that's, that's another thing that I wanted to mention back, probably in this context, it's important to mention that. So, yeah. and also why we are, I didn't mention early on, why we're doing paper base and electronic base is because if you look at our, if, well, if I share later on, I might share it, uh, the data collection form for the vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination, there is a consent form attached to it. So there is a legal aspect to that form as well. So when the person is signing the form, we can't do it electronically. They have to sign the paper form. So that's why we need to collect the paper base and then oh. we use that paper base to input the data on the system. So we have some challenges with regards to this, the, how can I say, the and process I think of that And I think you're, you're not alone in this challenge. We see I support uh, and coordinate a lot of our COVID efforts around the world through the HISP uh, mm -hmm. network. And, and we see that many countries are struggling with this. You know, you collect an aggregate number of how many vaccines have you received and administered. And then you have tracker on the site yeah. collecting the individuals. And very often, especially if the country is large, there is a mismatch. So you have, you know that you have mm -hmm. administered 200,000 doses, but you have 150,000 in tracker. And there is this gap because exactly what you're saying, this, it, it's busy, it's very time, it can be time consuming. And yeah, so you, uh, so for any, any tracker project, you need to think through this and try to visualize how things will, will happen. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Good, thank you so much for your insights. Then I'm going to jump to a topic that um, is also super important during collecting individual level data is uh, you need to consider the privacy policies and the legislation, I could have added that, uh, in your country. So uh, as also has been mentioned in the previous session, this, uh, you're, you're potentially collecting very sensitive data and you need to think through uh, what kind of data are you allowed to collect uh, for example, as I said, in one country, collecting, um, collecting religion and sexual orientation, for example, might be perfectly fine. In another country, it might be uh, completely forbidden to collect that kind of data. You need to think about what happens when this, uh, if this data is breached, somebody finds out, what kind of consequences does this have for the, for the individual? Um, and sort of very concretely, you need to figure out if there are existing legislation on collecting individualized sensitive data. If your country has policies or legislation for sharing individualized sensitive data between org units. So um, again, I can take an example from my own project where uh, we are a small country, but we're divided in like 300 different municipalities. And legally, it's each municipality is responsible for collecting data about COVID positive and their contacts. But people, they don't care if they're living in municipality one or two. So you have lots of cases where one person has infected or been in contact with people from 20 different municipalities. And they're all registering in their separate systems and they're not allowed to exchange data because of privacy laws. So you, you need to figure out what is the rules in your, in your country and it might put some limitations on your system uh, that you need to be aware of. And you also have to understand and know if there are policies or legislation for storing these digital records. Are there requirements for where the server is hosted, for example? Can you do, um, can you do cloud based hosting or does the server have to be located in the basement at the Ministry of Health? Um, yeah, so you need to figure out these things. What kind of access control are the requirements for that authentication? Is it perhaps only authorized health personnel with some sort of government authorization who should be allowed to see this data? Do they have to be employed at the clinic to see the data? And so on. Uh, and you can, 
you can sort of say that the end goal is of course not to harm anyone and you don't want to end up in the newspaper uh, and be like a scandal of projects because you haven't done your homework properly. Are there any considerations? You said in Afghanistan, you don't really have any, any, uh, any of this legislation or it was a bit non-existent. So how do you plan to solve this? Uh, I think, yes, this is one point which uh, make me um, think much. Uh, you know, uh, although we do not have such a, an infrastructure or legal infrastructure to restrict us or to direct us, but still we have to have uh, this kind of uh, protocols in our organization and uh, that will be the guiding principles and we can also use uh, some um, guidelines you uh, used by other projects we implement. Uh, but the main problem comes in terms of uh, the cultural uh, setup here in Afghanistan um, around um, gender issues and uh, the interaction uh, between females from the community with uh, male health workers uh, and generally recording their particulars, the individual information. Those are the things which need uh, uh, some advocacy and uh, consultation with the community. And also you, you know that we are in active uh, um, conflict everywhere in the country mm -hmm. and uh, from the opposition groups uh, this uh, could be something they would not allow or if uh, they can get access to the devices uh, which holds uh, the personalized information that could be a problem. So we have to sort that out, but uh, for, at the moment, the health facility we have uh, selected, um, it's uh, relatively safe from uh, um, interruption from the uh, armed op opposition groups uh, and also we can do the advocacy easily because it's uh, a relatively urban area uh, but when we go to a uh, large scale expansion these are the consideration we have to uh, be very much careful of and uh, we have to have some proper planning in the uh, preparation thank you so much mike you have your hand up Yes, thanks. And I, I think that uh, Afghanistan is is a, a highlight of how challenging this can be in the absence of legislation or policies that determine for you what is possible, but also having, I think, very challenging uh, kind of uh, uh, environmental and cultural reasons why this is something to take very seriously. I think that the do no harm principle is something we should all keep in mind, even in the context of legislation. So we, we, as public health individuals, I think we often have a tendency to overemphasize data and what we want to collect. It sounds very nice for us to include income levels. We want to get at uh, income inequality. We, we want to know how every person in the system may be related to others and how that might impact disease. We want to know uh, age and gender and, and all of these things which, when it comes down to it, you should really assess your specific program and see which of these really matters. What part of it should we collect? Because once it is in your system, it needs to be protected forever. And so you should be careful about what you are willing to include in the system. It should have a very clear reason for being there. And you should have mitigation strategies for how the data are protected. So again, I know for, for many of you in your countries, there isn't going to be adequate legislation or policies about what should or should not be done. But I, that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to really think through what is the worst case scenario. If this data were to get out, what could it be used for inappropriately? How bad would it harm an individual? And weigh that worst case scenario against your health reason for having that information in the system. It's always possible in the future to add new data elements. If you really realize, okay, it's, it's very important that we start to collect this information, then it can always be included in the future. But once it's being collected and it's in the system, then it's much harder to remove that data and you must remember that it's something to be protected forever. So again, I'm just, just wanting to emphasize how serious this is and that when we sit down to configure a system and when we're having discussions with the national programs or with the care providers, 
always have a little bit of, of kind of skepticism or hesitancy about uh, something that seems like very sensitive information and be thinking about the ways to try to mitigate problems with collecting that piece of information. Uh, Abdul? <clears throat> yes, Mike, thank you for pointing out uh, these important points. Uh, you know, although we do not have uh, uh, mm, substandard uh, uh, laws, uh, data protection laws, uh, but fortunately the humanitarian assistance uh, or the humanitarian sec sector is much active here due to the different uh, conflicts in uh, other reasons. And uh, just yesterday we submitted three proposals for health, nutrition and uh, protection. And uh, part of the process was to comply with uh, the AAP accountability to affected persons uh, a framework uh, and the protection mean streaming uh, and uh, many other things which were, which were uh, um, uh, stipulated uh, in, in the view of the data protection uh, protocols used by U UN OCHA. So uh, the UN OCHA and the humanitarian sector somehow sensitized or informed people, uh, although we do not have a government side legislation, but uh, there are some other uh, tools that uh, sensitizes us and also gives us uh, direction on how to take care of the protection issues. I think that that's a really important point. Yes, absolutely. And there are a number of, of uh, humanitarian groups, NGOs and academic institutions that are putting out recommendations around these health data and what to do, especially in complex settings or especially with vulnerable populations. So I really do encourage you to look around. I know that there are groups that have come out of the Harvard School of Public Health that have published uh, guidelines. The Doctors Without Borders, MSF, uh, have guidelines. There are various groups that have put out guidelines. So it is, it's really worth looking at those. A another two points that I would mention on this is you also have some confidence in your, your health worker or the people in the system that they already are managing uh, without being guided or asked to ask every piece of information. So you may assume that because this seems like relevant information, I should put it in the system. But it may be that that information is fine to stay out of the system, that your care provider actually already is able to deal with issues of age or, or income inequality because there are already kind of informal practices for doing so. So again, not having it in the system doesn't prevent it from being a factor in care. It doesn't prevent it from being a factor in, in decision-making. It's just something to think about is what are the current informal approaches of dealing with some of these sensitive issues. Another important point is to, to realize we do have two individual data models. One is tracker where everything is linked to a person and it's identifiable and it will be linked to that person forever in your system. But the other is event data, where it is not necessarily linked to a person. So it may be that you really want to have a better understanding of the income strata in a given area. You don't need to attach that to vaccine records. You could actually do an anonymous event as well and collect that kind of information. If it's not something that really needs to be linked to a person, but rather is an important piece of data that you could collect anonymously, you can make use of the event uh, capture uh, data model. So there again, could, yeah. no, go no. ahead, Anna. No, I said there you could typically collect like male 44 years old earning X amount of dollars. You don't know who that person is, but you can add maybe a couple of characteristics that could give interesting statistics in the end if that's Again, who is asking for the data? In what settings will this data be used? Will there be any decisions based on this data? Um, uh, yeah. yeah I agree absolutely. With Mike. It's, a good way, it's a good way of collecting sort of additional information if it is relevant for some sort of decision making. Right. And remembering maybe even also that just the, the presence of a person in your system itself could be confidential and sensitive information. So there are many health programs that focus on specific groups of vulnerable people, men who have sex with men, commercial sex workers, uh, undocumented uh, migrants. The, these are vulnerable groups that often have health programs that are, are trying to provide services. 
but by simply registering them in a program that is focused on men who have sex with men, that may put them at risk. And so you, you do want to think again about the value of having a named individual versus being able to, to collect some of the anonymous event data. But if you do have a named individual in a sensitive program like that, then your access controls become very important. The, who are the people that should be trusted to have access to the individual level data? You can report out aggregate data that doesn't include the identifying information as, as analytics to be shared more broadly, but who has the authority in the system to actually open up an individual's record and see their name, see their ID numbers, see that they're enrolled in an HIV program? That's something that you want to put serious thought into when you're designing the access controls. Again, DHS as a platform has very strong access controls, but only if you use them. If you create one type of user that accesses everything, then nothing is protected. Sorry, Anna. Uh, do you have any examples, Mike, of projects where I'm not even sure this has happened, but I was just thinking about it. Projects where you have um, you don't necessarily register the person's name, but you just register them with a certain ID and then you you're coupling the identifier with the name outside of Tracker in a separate, I don't know, encrypted system somewhere. Yeah, I think there, there are various ways of trying to handle this. One very kind of straightforward way would be that you, the, the <laughs> system can generate a unique ID. And that unique ID is only known to the system. It's not linked to any national ID database. It's not linked to the person. So you could register an individual with a generated ID that you give to them only. And then it's not something that anybody else has access to or could follow up on. There are still, of course, risks. There's risks that somebody could find their paper or their printed version with that ID and would be able to identify them. There's risk with all of these things. But what I guess is the most important thing is to take it very seriously and design an approach that is comfortable in your setting and that people feel good about. And kind of keep in mind, one of the, the privacy uh, ethics is the idea that we would do minimum data required. Um, again, in health, we are often feeling uh, excited about collecting all data possible to collect, but the best thing to do would be to collect the minimum amount of data that you need, because any data that isn't there also isn't vulnerable, and you can worry less about it. So it's something to, to just keep in mind. But the, I see Sherzada has a, has a hand up. Maybe I should uh, let them speak some more. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. In, in case of mine, you have, uh, you have pointed really, uh, Mike, uh, you have pointed out really important thing. But the tracker I'm planning that uh, we have, uh, I think Agarman will be also known for this because we have a detailed uh, information of each health, worker or health manager. Uh, so in, in this case, I think uh, this this is the reason, this is the main objective of our tracker that we want to have the full information like a profile from name, father name, ID, national ID, address and uh, the place he worked or she worked. Uh, so every single detail we are keeping it uh, for our record, uh, for, for the sake of our record, uh, which training he has participated in. And, and here, uh, in our case, I think the privacy is very important. This is what we have discussed before because this is the information of each individual across Afghanistan and the situation here is a bit like a tricky. Uh, so, so for this, we have planned the, the DHS to different privacy level, the different access level that we want to suppose the people uh, who will be accessing uh, DHS to the, 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 the MSH the training tracker uh, in provinces, they will be having only access to register or to enter the data. And in central level, we will be accessing the whole data. But I think uh, this is just like a, uh, I was a, uh, adding some point to the uh, privacy policy. Uh, this is very important. Uh, in some cases, we are not able to, uh, like uh, as Mike mentioned, that uh, supposing immunization and other program, health program, maybe we have a on the DJ store um, the generated ID you will use. But in, in case of mine, uh, because our objective is to have a complete profile of each participant for the specific training, uh, and maybe the participant at the end of two, three, four, five years, it become over 10,000, we don't know. But uh, uh, we are still keeping all those regards. And uh, for the privacy, 
uh, what we are doing, what we will be using different level of access to the, to the data of the, the MSH training uh, um, tracker. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I can't hear you. I know I'm sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, no, I said this okay. is a very interesting, uh, very interesting topic. There will be a separate, a separate session on <clears throat> on security next week, um, and we can go on discussing this forever and ever. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I have one yes. more. I have uh, one more topic uh, in this uh, presentation, um, and then we have a little uh, exercise from uh, from the academy team here that I will turn over to them. The last session, or the last uh, slide I have is uh, that you need to think through your interoperability needs. Um, think through sort of which other systems you need to link to, if you do need to link to them. Um, for, sometimes you would have to, to fetch data from another system or deliver data to another system. Um, so try to map that out. And again, think through why are you doing this interoperability? Is it worth the effort? Is it worth the cost? Doing interoperability work can be complex, challenging, it can be costly. And you have to think through that you would have to sort of maintain the system on both sides for the entirety of the, of the program. Uh, so if it changes in one place, you might have to make changes in your tracker program. So it's really worth thinking through interoperability in a conscious way. I think I will end it there.